the next session in our program is particularly dear to my heart. It's personal. It's about youth, rising Hispanic stars that need role models, that need people to figure it out. They need to see it, to be it. You see, my story working on Hispanic affairs started with my daughter, Tamara. When we moved to America six years ago, I had no clue that I was a Hispanic. I lived my entire life as a happy Mexican. I never heard of the term. And when I moved to America, I thought, wow, this is going to be great. Latinas are incredible power entrepreneurs, job creators, you know, like we made it all. But then I realized that it was hard that Latinas make 46% of the, of the salary of the dollar, that they have a harder chance. And we don't deserve that. And so having my daughter as my inspiration to create the world human and actually get involved in lifting this is the right thing to do. We all need to have conversations with the young people to make them see that the future is bright if we can actually give them role models and a path to follow. What do you think? I think that every time I hear you speak about being a Hispanic and being a Latina, I become proud of where I am from and my heritage. And that you shouldn't actually be paid less. <laughs> I agree. I should not be paid less. I should be equal to everyone else. And that's what the next session will be. It's about talking about the opportunities, having a dialogue between two monsters of the Hispanic community and young people that want to be given a chance, that want to be at the table, that want to be equally paid and giving a fair chance. I'm looking forward to a rich conversation and I know I'm going to have one with these two rock stars who have already in their youth achieved so much at a global level and I get the chance to actually be with a, per a person that I consider a personal mentor. Victor Arias, it's a treat to be here with you today. So let's go ahead and kick it off. Javier and Brandon, um, as rock stars of what you're doing at MIT and what you're doing in Philadelphia at Drexel, I want to know in the context of leadership, because that's what this summit is all about. Leadership in the Latino community. In that context, tell me what you care about. Who would like to go first? I can take it. Um, so for, well, thank you, Nina. It's such a, such a pleasure to be here and, and humbling at the same time. For me, um, the for the longest time, my, my biggest passion has been technology, but not technology for the sake of technology, but how to uh, give technology a purpose and make sure that it actually helps us and doesn't make us uh, its, its slave. Uh, but actually for the last two years, uh, and especially seeing the uh, what's happening with social media, my focus has shifted to mental health. So right now I'm, I'm doing a bit of research on on uh, yeah mental health and, and tech and how those two play together. How about you, wow. Brandon? Especially during a pandemic, right? Mental health yeah. seems to be a little bit taking center stage um as because of the result of this pandemic and the lockdowns and and the social distancing well thank you i can't wait to hear more about that brandon tell me what you're passionate about what do you care about yes of course thank you nina for having me here it really is such an honor to be a part of this conversation um i'm really passionate about helping our latino student community um i'm a first generation student myself so really growing up um you know, I've experienced some struggles and moving to a whole nother state because I'm originally from New Jersey. Um, but our student community was really affected by this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so I stepped up as the leader for the Philadelphia community and we were able to do our first kickoff campaign, uh, partnered with Prospanica Drexel to help our student community and raise some relief funds for them. That's incredible. So you're already taking a leadership role in your community at college. In college, I was just worried about surviving. <laughs> so I am uh, I'm delighted that you're already leaning in and you've used that word leaning into your own leadership. I know Victor has some questions. Victor? Well, thank you, because I, I want to hear from you all as well. Look, um, it's really interesting. I used to have dark hair like you all. Okay, of the three of you, okay, but as the old man in this group, I want to find out 
you know, what are the important things that drive you as the future of our country, the future of our society? What are the things that you look for in your work environment? What things are important for you? And so, Brandon, why don't we start off with you? Yeah, of course. I mean, I really think that diversity, equity, and inclusion is really what stands out to me in a company, um, especially when I'm looking for an internship or, you know, a future career after college. Um, but diversity, equity, and inclusion is extremely important, uh, should be every company's number one priority. Um, you know, it's definitely important to be inclusive of our minority community who feel mis underrepresented in the workplace and who may feel like they don't really have a voice. Great. Thank you, Brandon. Javier, any would, uh, Yeah, no, of course. Uh, so obviously I, I'll echo uh, what Brandon said, but uh, on top of that, I think um, I feel culture and purpose are, are two very important elements because uh, I think it's not only about making sure that you have uh, a diverse workplace in which everyone is, is valued and, and has a voice, but also that uh, no, whatever whatever this team of this group of people are doing, whether it's a company or nonprofit or government, there's actually driven by a common purpose and and hopefully uh, for good, right? So um, I think that that cultural element and, and mission driven is, is is also is also important. Good. I have one specific question for you, Javier, because it's important to note that you know you grew up in Spain, you're from Spain, and so this whole uh, organization and the movement around being hispanic or latino you know how do you resonate with that how you know how do you identify with that term that i'm sure was different when you grew up in spain absolutely no it's it's interesting and i think uh it's it's been um a, a rediscovery of, of of what it means to have common roots uh and and uh, i think uh, you know, the, the beautiful thing about the U.S. is that it's, it's, it's such a diverse country. And uh, obviously, because of geographic proximity, uh, you also, I also personally rediscover what the differences uh, and the commonality that is between all the different elements, but also the struggle that is associated and also the, you know, the, even the, the ancestral uh the, the, the ancestral uh, yeah frustration and and even from the spanish side sometimes the, the, the ancestral guilt uh that is carried over generations in, in a way so it's it's interesting how those things are at play but also how many opportunities open up now to you know build from now onwards and and, and you know create the create a future and i know you all have some p potential questions yourselves I would I actually, I, I would ask you both, uh, Victor and Nina, um, about what were some of the defining moments in your careers, those, those moments where it was like make it or break it or, or something happened or someone just appeared and, and, and pushed you forward. I'm, I'm very curious about, about knowing some of those. So um, I'll, I'll take a shot at this, uh, Nina, because your, your story is going to be much better than mine. But <laughs> no, look, for me, um, I'd always kind of moved along. I was the first one in my family to go to college. So nothing was really defined and there was not really a path for me. So I was kind of bumping along and doing things. But I think the defining moment for me was uh, when I had, uh, I ran into a lady at the university I went to in El Paso, University of Texas, El Paso, who was representing Stanford University. And I thought, oh, I've heard of that school. And she said, you know, you should apply to the business school. And I hadn't thought about it. I went through the motions. I applied and I got accepted. And for me, Stanford was life changing. It pivoted my life in directions I never would have thought. And it made me, it opened up doors for me that would never have opened up. Uh, I never forget where I'm from. I'm from El Paso. I'm from the Frontera. I'm Latino. But Stanford opened up all kinds of doors and uh, you have to take advantage of that. So that for me, that was a defining moment. Victor, that was that was beautiful, and I think he's being really shy. One of the things that uh, that um, you should know about Victor is that he embodies the words or the phrase that we have heard when we say preach the gospel at all times. Use words only when absolutely necessary. Uh, when I look at Victor's life and how he has lived his life and how he has been, for me, the defining moment in him is his leadership. He mentioned going to Stanford, but what he didn't mention that he's chairman 
of the alumni program at Stanford that now provides programs and services to scale millions of Hispanic businesses across the United States. So he has taken that degree and has turned it into goodness for thousands and hopefully millions of people to come. And the legacy that he's leaving on the Latino community cannot be understated. The, his children have worked, have are highly educated like him, but have also worked in the nonprofit world. Many times they've gone into nonprofit making less because I know why had their father probably pushed them into understanding how the nonprofit uh, and the community works to get that appreciation for the richness of our community and to never forget where they came from despite their elite education. So Victor, let me just take a moment right now to call you out and say what an amazing legacy you are leaving in everyone's hearts and minds. Um, what you've done with your career, you've, you have been at the forefront of Latinos sitting on boards. It's not lost on us that you were one of the, the, the very early achievers of that momentous um, position by serving on Popeye's, boards, uh, Popeye's board. And so in the work that you're now doing, helping other Latinos and other people strive to that. So I know you are as humble as the day is long, but as our listeners are listening today, one of the key things that I want them to take away is how we have, we love the community so much and that we have people like you that are here to share your time and your efforts and your advice. So thank you for that. Thank you. Your uh, story. Your story, Nina, your story. <laughs> I won't get into too long uh, of my story, but um, I am an immigrant to this country. My mother and father came from Quito, Ecuador, South America. So I, we, we did start with absolutely nothing. And I have grown up with um, a, a, an immigrant mindset that failure is not an option. Uh, a defining moment for me, probably, well, I've had so many defining moments. That's because, well, I'll never say the word old. I'm just tenured. I'm tenured. As I become more tenured and more mature, I feel like every decade or every seven to 10 years, I have a defining moment. Um, but for me, one of the biggest defining moments um, was actually along with, uh, with Victor's is getting that college degree because that college degree has opened doors for me in a way that I never dreamed possible. Um, and I, I too have tried to uh, live in um, and do what Victor is doing by going back to my alma mater. And I'm, I'm proud to announce that I am the first uh, to establish an entrepreneurial center at Texas State University where I graduate from. I'm the first investor to do so because I believe in remembering where you came from. Um, my life, uh, the defining moment for me was actually achieving that and being one of the first in my family to do so, not the last, just the first. Uh, but that gave me the opportunity, I think, to, um, to set, the, set the stage as an entrepreneur. So uh, I started my business when I was 25 years old, and it was the first company I started and the last company I've started. And 20, almost 25 years later, I just dated myself, um, the journey continues, and I feel like there's a lot of work to be done. So for me, that's, um, that's a defining moment. So I'm going to turn it back around to you all. Um, you've probably had some defining moments in your lives to make the decisions that you've had to make. Um, and, you know, kind of like, you know, like Nina's story where she's kind of had to pull herself up and, you know, with her family and she's got an incredible mother, by the way, that uh, it's her, her mini me. And she's, uh, I can see why Nina drives the way she does. So, you know, what is that drive within each of you that compels you to do the things that you do? Uh, so, Brandon, can we, you know, would you share a little bit about that with your story? Yeah, of course. I mean, thank you guys both. Those are both truly inspiring stories. Um, but <clears throat> going back to my story, I, I'm definitely been driven by ambition. So Drexel's motto is actually ambition can't wait. And it fits very perfectly for um, that emotion that I really give off. I'm ambitious to really take charge and, you know, become a leader so young um, in my career um, to really take charge and, and to just be an advocate for the community. It's it's really inspiring and it really empowers That's me to awesome. do better. Javier, any 
you know, your, your story as well. What drives you? Wow. Um, I think for a very long time, uh, or, or at least at the, at the beginning of my career, um, it was uh, seeking justice. I think that was something uh, important for me, not, not, not kind of uh, revenge in any way, but actually kind of seeing things that uh, were off and, and trying to create solutions or propose solutions uh, that, that uh, tackle that. And, you know, it came, it came from uh, a very uh, personal humbling story of, of you know being bullied in in school because I was a figure skater and then uh, being able to turn that into my entrepreneurial career and then moving on to that. So at the beginning it was that, but then later on as I was creating products and interacting with people, seeing the impact, uh, and also through Global Shapers, like creating community uh, initiatives and seeing the impact on people, that's actually what it's the real fuel. Uh, that's the most energet energizing thing that I can imagine. It's just seeing that people you know benefit from your work and and hopefully it's good work and and that's what at least keeps me going but i'm sure for you as well it's, it's a big motivator that's great nina do you have any questions nina i sure do i want to know how someone begins five different companies at, at such a young age tell us a little bit more about your entrepreneurial career um, uh, well, almost by, uh, by pure serendipity, <laughs> if anything, but, uh, elaborating it a bit on what I, I just said, I was a figure skater. I stopped doing that. And that kind of creative energy had to flow somewhere and it flew, it flew, uh, into, you know, building technology and, and, but not only that. Uh, so when I was 15 in high school and it's, it's a longer story that we have time for, but I think it, you know the the key insight is you know when when you get really passionate about something and you start thinking about solutions you come up with some with with a, with with a project and the project starts becoming more serious and suddenly you you realize you need more help so you start hiring people and before you realize you, you have what you would call a company but the company is the consequence is not the first step it's just you know when something needs to to materialize um Brandon, I would love to hear a bit more about the organization you are part of uh in in Philadelphia yeah, of course. Um, well, I'm also the president and founder of Prospanica Drexel, um, which as a national organization, it's the National Association for Hispanic Professionals. Um, and this was our first student chapter that we founded here in the Northeastern region. So we were very proud of that to really not only impact uh, Drexel University, but we could impact the Northeastern region, you know, outside of the greater Philadelphia area. Um, but I definitely have a question for you two. Uh, I would love to hear a piece of advice that really inspired you or impacted the best piece of advice you've ever received. And if you could go back to your younger self, what piece of advice would you give yourself then? Well, I guess I'll take that one. So that was two questions. One is what is the biggest, the best piece of advice? I, I am very blessed. I have had a tremendous amount of mentors and advisors, and I think it's a result of having a, um, I've always had a learner mindset. I've always wanted to seek more and be more and grow mentally, spiritually, as, as a business person, as a, as a human. And so I've had a lot of mentors in my life. So to pick the one piece of advice is difficult. I, I probably will, um, I'll probably talk about my grandmother. Um, Victor's heard me talk about my mom a lot and I have a great relationship. I'm very family oriented, but my grandmother gave me a piece of advice that was very consistent in my whole life. And I never really understood what she was saying to me until now that I'm mature. She used to always tell me, aprende a vivir sola, aprende a vivir sola. And I didn't understand what that meant. I said, I thought, what on earth is she trying to tell me? And what it really meant as a woman to be self-made, to be independent, um, and to, to learn how to take care of myself. And, um, and, and for me that has been rang, um, or so true. It's not about being in her words, what she was trying to seek is, is an independent woman and someone who, um, would lean on her own talents. And I, I have, I went on to be a, a self-made woman and start my own company um, after that. But for me, that's probably the best piece of advice I've, I've gotten. As um, the second thing you asked is, what is the second thing you asked? <laughs> you asked two questions. Uh, what's a piece of advice you would give to your younger self? Oh, the piece of advice I'd give to my younger self. 
Oh boy, the piece of advice that I would give to my younger self um, is patience. You know, uh, the, the, there is a saying that there is always a next level. And I, the, the, young, the, the piece of advice I would give to my younger self is be patient with yourself because leadership is a lifelong journey. Um, success is not about um, a monetary value. It is, it, 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 the, the, your leadership is a lifelong journey and it will have its ups and downs. And for me, I, I would say to myself, as a, as a young girl, I was ambitious as well, positively ambitious. And um, I would tell my younger self to be patient and to understand that the role of a conscious leader is a role that's less traveled because it's a role where you're constantly reflecting uh, back on yourself and your leadership and you're constantly learning and leaning in to be more and to learn more and to be a more conscious leader. And that is a very, very difficult place to be um, because it requires a lot of self-reflection and it requires a lot of transformation on your part. I have transformed myself. I was 25 years old when I started my first business. Today, I run a company that spans over 10 countries. Um, I'm not the same person I was when I was 25 years old. I've had to transform myself, my leadership skills, my business acumen. Um, I have had to transform myself completely because the way you run a $1 million business is not the same as you run it. A hundred million dollar business is not the same as you run a billion dollar enterprise. And so for me that the adaptation and the transformation and the constant seeking um, is a long road. And I, I would say to my younger self, be patient, uh, give yourself a little grace. It is okay to be happy with um, your achievements and expect more of yourself. Uh, just be patient. That was a very long answer. It was a great answer because it talks a lot about you. You see why she has one of the largest Latino businesses in the country, number one. Number two, you can see why many corporations want her advice uh, on their boards. She's on three corporate boards. I mean, it's just, it's understandable. And uh, and so many kudos to to my colega, to, to my amiga Nina. Um, I also go back to my grandmother. Um, uh, because I remember, you know, my grandmother lived in the projects in a, a two room apartment. Um, and I remember she would always have, uh, and the kitchen was room and the bedroom was the other one. The kitchen was in the kitchen. She always had a radio on and she'd be cooking whatever or baking, whatever. And she was always had the radio on. And, uh, and I remember at one time there was a song by Jose Alfredo Jimenez playing. And um, and in one of the lines, she goes, "Mijo, mijo, listen to this." And it's and it's one of my mantras. It's no hay que llegar primero, pero hay que saber llegar. And so it's really, as Nina says, life is a journey. It's not about this immediacy right here. It's about how you get to the other side. And so, you know, that's been you know my my guiding light for my entire life. And it is about taking the steps today, knowing that there's a longer game in place. And so, um, you know, and with that comes a, a, an incredible sense of developing the right sense of humility, which takes me back to my advice uh, for me as a younger person. Because one of the things that my dad also taught me was the importance of personal relationships. So in my quest to develop those personal relationships, I go back to my younger self and I was, so intent on, on doing that, I was back slapping people and, you know, but I wasn't genuine about my relationships. And so I would go back to my younger self and say, pay attention to the people and don't just shake their hands and then look away. Take an interest in the people because they will change your lives. You'll come back. You'll see them later on. And uh, so that's the advice that I would give to my younger self. So. Um, I'm going to ask the, the closing question here for each of you, okay? Um, again, I look to you as the future. Um, so what is, what is the one thing that you hope for this world to be in the next five to 10 years? What's the one thing that you want this 
to do the things to happen. So Brandon, I'm going to give that one to you for right now, and then I'm going to cl we'll close with Javier. Well, I feel like that's definitely a tough question to end on. <laughs> uh, definitely has got me thinking for that one. Um, but I think I'm going to have to go back to really the topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion. I feel like, you know, corporate America is really not where it should be in that specific area. And I think, you know, leadership summits such as this one is really impactful to show those under misrepresented voices within corporate America and to really show their fight, their stand, um, to be able to speak up. So I, I really hope to see in the next few years that it, it just become mandatory, you know, that it just becomes mandatory for every company in corporate America to establish a DEI initiative and framework. Great, great. Javier? That's a, that's a great point, Brandon. And um, I, I, was, I was thinking from that, uh, I was gonna give a different answer, but I think going to the, going to the basics, uh, if, if everyone in the world just realized that we are humans, that it's almost a miracle that we're just a bunch of atoms held together that happen to think and, and, and feel, uh, if, if we all came to that mutual understanding, it would be so much easier to realize that we're people, all of the barriers and, and you know, not only ethnicity or, or background, but all the other many barriers, whether you went to this university or you, you didn't have a chance, all of those disappear and then we're able to play on a level field and, and then realize that it's about building together. Uh, so it's wishful thinking, but I wish <laughs> we all awoke to that reality. Well, look, thank you guys both for your answers. You are our rock stars. I hope you can you know, become the next Nina Vaca uh, with your businesses and your endeavors that you build up. And so we're just uh, so grateful for you to be here. And I, I'm thankful to my comadre, to Nina, and, and also to Claudia Romo Edelman for all that she's done and Michelle for everything that you've put together. So with that, we close out this session. We thank you all and adelante. And Feliz Navidad. Feliz <laughs> Navidad. Igualmente, gracias. Thank you.